Mindful of the uh, fact that the success of chairing one of these sessions very much depends upon uh, keeping to time, um, I would like to declare this session open. The topic uh, that you're about to, uh, to hear is an irresistible compulsion to arbitrate, or putting it another way, the topic embodies the concept of arbitration when there is no choice. And I think we've all probably to a certain point always looked at the arbitral process as being one of choice. The paper that uh, Royden was about to deliver highlights a surprisingly large number of regulations and acts where arbitration is compulsory and is not a matter of choice. Now, we heard uh, Daniel Calderimus say that arbitration will not work without the state support. And it's comforting, I think, when one looks at the number of acts and regulations which provide for compulsory arbitration. Uh, it's comforting to think that the state is behind the arbitration process. Uh, and I think that's a theme which has developed uh, throughout this morning's papers, that there is the support for the arbitral process. Um, as the paper that will be delivered will note, things are not always as they seem. And there is a need when looking at a statute or regulation, as Royden will, will highlight, to consider the particular wording of the statute or the regulation. It can't just be assumed, as Royden will point out, that it's a carte blanche, there are some hooks in some of the regulations and the wording of the statutes. So without further ado, I think you're all, you're all, you all know Royden. Royden's most primarily uh, known as his uh, chairmanship of, for his chairmanship of the Human Rights uh, Review Tribunal from 2002 to 2011. Uh, and he wrote an excess of 300 published decisions over that time, so he's well used to, uh, to uh, the judgment or arbitral award writing process. Uh, he became a member of the Independent Bar in 1996 and is uh, very experienced in matters of arbitration. With that, Royden, I'm going to ask you to deliver your paper. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, good morning uh, or good afternoon now. Um, I'm the light relief, I think, after a fairly heavy morning. Uh, of interesting ideas. Um, I will deliver my paper, but I can't resist uh, starting by saying, Nick, that it is depressing to be at a conference and hear that there are still arbitral matters in the country that couldn't be arbitrated and had to go to court because one party would only have one arbitrator and the other party would only have the other arbitrator. You cannot tell me that there are not more than two arbitrators in New Zealand who could do an arbitration within a year. Uh, it is also vaguely depressing to hear that people still go to arbitration and find that they have bought a curial experience with the delays and all the rest of it that come with it. And it is also vaguely depressing to hear that people still spend months arguing about who their arbitrator should be when there are perfectly good avenues for independent appointment of arbitrators through Ammons, through John Green's New Zealand Dispute Resolution Centre, uh, through the Law Society. So that's my, that's my moan. And uh, I, I, uh, I just hope that those kinds of problems are things that we can work on. I think that in this respect, arbitrators are their own worst enemies. We have to deliver, when we are instructed to arbitrate, we have to deliver a cost-effective, efficient, just process, and we have to do it better than the courts. That's, that's the end of that. All right, arbitration when there's no choice. That's all the things that you want if you are going to choose arbitration, but I want to look at the question of arbitration when you haven't got a choice. And um, the, uh, the reason that I became interested in this topic was that I had a particular uh, fortnight earlier this year when three things fell into place. The first was that I was asked out of the blue, very welcome, but out of the blue, to act uh, as an arbitrator under the Crown Minerals Act. 
to determine disputes relating to the right of access to land for the purposes of mineral exploration. And uh, of course I said uh, yes, and then I picked the act up. Uh, and um, I was interested, having said yes, when I picked the act up, at what I had let myself in for. Um, but the thing that struck me was that under that process, the parties involved didn't have a choice about arbitrating. They had to go to arbitration. So I thought, well, that's curious. And about two days later, I became involved, for completely different reasons, in a matter involving a right-of-way dispute. And again, I went digging around to find out how on earth the appointment process worked. And I found, to my even greater surprise, that under the Land Transfer Act regulations as they have stood since 2002, if you've got a scrap about an easement, that is to say a right of way, whether or not you've got an electricity easement, all those easements that are registered under the Land Transfer Act, you now have to go to arbitration. Under Clause 14 of the fourth schedule to the Land Transfer Act regulations 2002, once you have had a crack at trying to resolve the problem with your neighbour, you must go to arbitration. And I thought to myself, well, that really is curious, because those cases used to be dealt with by the courts. Uh, and so, you know, imagine in a room full of arbitrators, we could all nod vigorously and say, well, that's wonderful. We think it's fantastic that these disputes are going to arbitration and not to the courts. But I suspect if I was addressing a group of lawyers who are involved in constitutional issues and access to justice issues, they would be saying, well, hang on. How come we now have to pay to get a decision? So that was. It. Then I went to, uh, to 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 the door, the office two doors down from mine, who is uh, Surian Barker, and we were talking about these things. And he said, "Well, look, I've just I did one recently under relating to commodities, and you know I don't think they had a a, a choice about arbitrating there either, under the commodities legislation that uh, that Surian was dealing with them." So I thought, well, I think it's worth having a look at this. How common is this practice, a legislative practice, of requiring matters to go to arbitration rather than through the courts? And that's the topic. That's the reason why I have had a look at uh, the issue. As I've said in my paper, I think the paradigm that we all accept at the start and that we normally work to is that arbitration is a profoundly consensual process you can decide whether or not you're going to arbitrate. And even once you've decided to arbitrate, you can decide who your arbitrator is going to be and you can decide what rules the arbitrator is going to uh, apply. And of course, the Act and the schedules are really fallback positions when you can't agree those details or don't, don't want to uh, be bothered to try. Um, and so, I th as I say, I thought, well, what, to, to what extent is, is this a feature of the legislative landscape today? Now, we all know, I think, instinctively, that there are certain types of dispute which the legislature has for many, many, many years uh, used arbitration as a favourite dispute resolution technique. And uh, I'm thinking about fixing rentals under, uh, in, in public body, uh, public authority or public body uh, lease cases, uh, fixing the value, fixing the, the amount of compensation in certain cases. Those. I think instinctively we, we know about, but um, uh, I think some of the examples I've given you fall outside those categories. So the question then becomes, well, what are we, what are we really interested in? Uh, the first point is that I'm not interested in international arbitration. Well, I don't mean that unkindly, I'm very interested in international arbitration, but in this exercise, I want to see what's happening domestically. So I've excluded from the uh, consideration uh, all of the state versus state and state versus individual type of arbitrations that you've just heard about in the last uh, session. I'm also not here thinking about situations where people are committed to arbitration because of a commercial contract they wrote five years ago. They rather wish now they didn't have to go to arbitration, but it's in the contract. Um, that's, that's still, in my view, a situation where the parties are choosing to arbitrate, and of course the legislature has nothing to say about that anyway. Nor am I really interested in arbitration processes where uh, the process can be made available uh, by a, an entity, say the High Court or the District Court, but again, where the parties agree. Uh, and both, I, th I think I'm right to say that under the 1908 Act, the High Court certainly had a power to refer certain issues to uh, arbitration, 
but with the uh, more recent amendments, um, I couldn't tell you exactly uh, when, when they came in so far as the High Court and District Court rules are concerned. Uh, the position now is that uh, the High Court and the District Court can direct that something goes to arbitration, but only if the parties agree. And that doesn't seem to me to be like compulsory arbitration. Uh, Sarin did tell me when he read, he was kind enough to read a, a draft in my paper that if you look at the fifth schedule to the Arbitration Act, it may be oversimplifying things to say that the District Court has no power to compel arbitration. But um, that's a footnote. I don't know whether that's right or, or, or not. But certainly, I'm not interested in situations where parties are saying, well, let's deal, deal with it this way. Um, and as, as I've said in the paper, despite you know, when, when you take those things out of the mix, you've, you've still got the cases like fixing rental values, uh, share milking, of course. I, I know that share milkers have just been talking in the next room. Or, um, I think people have been involved in, in those uh, disputes. But, you know, you can find the original legislation related to share milking disputes in the early 1930s. So uh, that's not a new area. Um, so um, really, I guess the other, the other slight wrinkle to it are those legislations that deal with regulation of commodities. Now, there's a lot of them. Um, and typically, what you've got is a situation where an industry, uh, beekeeping, the ape purists, or people who sell cereal silage, or people who sell mandarins, uh, are levied for whatever the industry purpose might be, whether it's to uh, for, for training of the building industry gets levied for building research purposes. And if you have an argument there as to whether or not you are properly the subject of the levy, or whether the levy that has been levied is too high, uh, or conversely, if you might be entitled to some compensation. Uh, and the question is whether you are entitled to the compensation under the, under the, the relevant legislation, and then it's so how much, and whether or not you've engaged in behaviour that should disqualify you from being able to access the, that compensation. I suppose you can take that group of cases and think, well, here you're looking at a situation where the legislature has imposed a levy or created a right. And so the obligation to arbitrate those disputes is integral with the right or responsibility that's created. And in a way, it's not really, it doesn't matter whether there's party choice involved because you wouldn't have to pay the levy or be able to access the compensation but for the legislation anyway. So I'm not sure quite where they fit in. You still have to arbitrate those disputes. Um, I've talked already about the uh, land transfer regulations and made the point that uh, that really did seem to me to be a recent example, 2002, those that, that legislation was introduced, where uh, the legislature had gone away from the traditional use of arbitration uh, into something a little bit uh, newer. Uh, another difficult group to categorise are the provisions which require arbitration in the context of building societies and friendly societies, because very often what, what, what the clauses that I've found will say, uh, you, if you have a provision for arbitration in the company's constitution, then the Act governs how the arbitration is to be uh, undertaken. Uh, but Again, you could say, oh, well, that comes back to the uh, rules of the society, which is, in a sense, an agreement. So I'm not quite sure where, that, where they fit in. But as we'll see, um, the technique has been extended more recently into the Companies Act proper. And uh, I think that is a significant uh, change. Uh, what makes the research even more difficult are the categories of cases where legislation says that if you've got a dispute of this kind or that kind, you may appoint an arbitrator. Um, I've given the example in my paper of the Fisheries Act. Um, curiously, the Fisheries Act is one of uh, a number of bits of legislation which say that if you have a dispute and you are going to go to arbitration and you can't agree on your arbitrator, then the president of the of Ammons will appoint the arbitrator. And I just thought as a footnote that it was curious that Ammons turns up in about a half a dozen legislative and regulatory measures as the appointing authority. Um, the, 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 this, this particular part of the Fisheries Act relates to disputes between uh, 
uh, quota holders and people who are going to engage in aquaculture activities which tend to be uh, under the Resource Management Act and coastal activities. So I presume, I don't know much about the area, but I presume that what happens is that by virtue of the activity that's going on close to the land where maybe it's salmon farming or something of that sort, uh, the quota holders ability to access the full amount of their quota is compromised. So if you're going to have an argument about the extent to which that has got to be compensated for, you, you may refer the matter to arbitration. And if you do, the Fisheries Act tells you what the methodology that the arbitrator has to employ is and how the arbitrator is to go about making his or her decision. And so I don't think, if you read that legislation properly, it's really a matter of choice. I can't imagine that the legislature intended for you to have a choice about whether or not you go to arbitration. I'm pretty confident that, in fact, if you've got that kind of argument, you've got to go to arbitration, even though that's not the language of the statute. Uh, of course, there's a lot of historical um, examples. I talked about some of the things to do with public leases and uh, valuations and what have you. If you do a search on the word arbitration across all statutes in New Zealand, which is what I've done, you get a lot of historical uh, clutter, uh, some of which is interesting. And amongst uh, it is the Wellington and Manawatu Railway Purchase Act 1908, <laughs> by which any disputes about the valuation uh, of the railway line and assets had to be resolved by arbitration. The reason I thought that was curious is because section something or other of the Act specifies that the Act is deemed to be a contract. The Act itself is deemed to be a contract. And I think that must have been because in 1908 no one thought that you could really arbitrate things unless there was an underlying agreement to do so. I may be wrong about that, but I just thought that was a very curious provision. Uh, and there's, uh, there's a whole host of acts that are generally titled, titled reserves and other lands disposal uh, and public bodies empowering acts, a whole host of them that uh, give mandatory arbitration powers. But I, I really think those are historical, of historical value uh, only. Um, and then the final complicating factor, if you're going to ask the question about how common this is, uh, is that there are some acts that contain what I'm happy to say are just flat out mistakes. If you look at the Commodities Act, Section 11 of the Commodities Act 1990, it talks about uh, orders for levies. Uh, this is where there's going to be a levy on a commodity it's of the kind I've talked about. Uh, and it says that um, every levy order must provide for the appointment of mediators to resolve disputes as to whether or not any person is required to pay a levy or the amount of the levy. Uh, it goes on to say, such orders must also have a right of appeal to a district court judge against the decision of the mediator. Um, and in fact, if you go and look at any of the many orders that have been made under that, uh, uh, and I counted 30 something over the years, um, they all do faithfully uh, uh, contain provisions, about 10 or so separate regulations for the appointment of mediators to resolve disputes and if not resolve them, to determine them and they have a right of appeal to the district court. Um, and uh, I just, I just, I, I can't rationalise that on any other basis than that whoever drafted those provisions didn't really understand the difference between the role of a mediator and the role of a decision maker. So if we're going to go and say, well, the, 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 the research question we started with is how common is this technique of, ref of requiring matters to be arbitrated rather than go through the courts. Those are some of the com confronting factors. But overall, uh, if you search, as I have, for the word arbitration in every single act of regulation, you come up with about 950 hits. And when you take out cross-references and duplication and you think about all the things I've been talking about, you do find that there is a residue of some very interesting provisions. Um, I'm going to talk first of all about something called compel the negotiate arbitrate provisions of the Commerce Act. I don't know if anyone's had to look at those. But in 2008, Parliament was struggling with the problem of what you do when you've got an industry where there is little or no competition. 
and no, not much chance of any such competition. And, and I'm told informally that really this was about the airports and landing charges, uh, and possibly also about electricity lines companies. Uh, and uh, it was thought in line with um, practice overseas that a good idea would be to have a process whereby the suppliers and the customers negotiate, and then if they can't reach uh, an agreed settlement, uh, the Commerce Commission will impose arbitration on them. In early drafts of the legislation, the Commerce Commission was itself going to be the arbitrator. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's survived. Uh, but what is interesting about that, that, that provision is that having, having identified that the Commerce Commission has the power in issuing a determination as to how to deal with these situations to require that something be arbitrated, uh, the next section goes on to say that the arbitration will not be conducted under the 1996 Act, full stop. And for the life of me, I don't know where that leads you. I'm told this hasn't actually happened, so um, maybe it doesn't matter yet, but um, I think it's going to be very interesting if and when anyone is appointed as an arbitrator uh, under the um, negotiate arbitrate provision, arbitrate provisions of the Commerce Act as it stood since 2008, to know exactly what A, you're doing, and B, how you're going to do it, and C, once you've done it, how you're going to be indemnified if you get it wrong, and who's going to tell you that you got it wrong? And there's a whole host of questions. Um, another interesting one, and, and this is from someone who in, in a former life did a bit of um, companies uh, litigation, but uh, since 2008, I think, the Companies Act now has provisions whereby uh, arguments in minority shareholder cases are to be arbitrated, but compulsory arbitrated. Now, the extent of the change in the company's legislation, section 1121A, I'm not clear and I haven't really gotten to the bottom of it. It may only apply to situations where the company is buying the minority shareholder's shareholder, as opposed to situations where another shareholder is buying that. But certainly in a situation where there is an argument about value uh, for the exchange of a minority block of shares, under Section 112 of the Companies Act, you now go to arbitration. You don't go to court. I was surprised by that, to be honest. That's, uh, doesn't, that seemed to me to be a significant change. Um, there are specialised contexts, uh, such as the access issues under the Crown Minerals Act, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on if I have time. Uh, but um, uh, another one is uh, the Education Act. If uh, a parent or a caregiver has a scrap with the Education Department, Ministry of Education, about the classification of their child for the purposes of funding special needs education, that goes to an arbitrator. And in fact, there's about two pages of requirements for, for the, the skill set the arbitrator has to have, the procedure that's to be followed, who can be there, uh, there's a lot of information in the Education Act about that situation. Um, I've talked about the Land Transfer Act and the regulations. I won't talk about them again. Just some curious um, examples. Uh, if the Office of the Auditor General has a scrap with any of the government departments that it gets to audit about who should pay the Auditor's General's fees and how much fees it's appropriate for the Auditor General to charge for the luxury of being investigated, um, that's got to be dealt with by arbitration. Remember, these are situations where you, it, it, unless someone runs a sort of constitutional argument that none of this legislation was truly intended to exclude the courts, on the face of it, these are all situations where you now have to buy your own decision. You have to go to an arbitrator and buy a decision. All right? Now, some, in some of this legislation, there are provisions for that kind of problem under the Crown Minerals Act, uh, I'm happy to say. There is a very clear provision that the uh, person who wants to come onto land for the purpose of exploration uh, is, uh, is to pay the whole cost of the exercise, including the cost of the lawyer representing the landowner. 
but it's not always so clear. Um, I, I have, I, I'm, I'm not going through my paper in exactly this, the order that I've written it, but I, I have raised a question, which as I say, uh, seems to me to be a, a philosophical question about whether or not this is, this is right. That I now have to, I can't, I can't go and, and, and bother the local district court judge about whether or not someone has obstructed my right of way by putting a gate across it. I've actually got to go and pay for an arbitrator to, to make that decision instead. Um, but I'm not going to try and persuade this audience that that's a bad thing. Uh, and uh, instead I just wanted to look a little bit at the question of the way in which these statutory references are, are written, because the overall thesis of my paper is uh, that there is absolutely no consistency in the way in which this is done at all. And in fact, in some cases, it's very unclear exactly what you're left with once you've got a statutory reference to arbitration. Now, if I can, um, we all know the transitional provisions of the Arbitration Act, and we all understand uh, that um, a provision that, in an act that referred to the 1908 Act is now deemed to refer to the 1906 Act, and any reference to a submission to arbitration is now to be a, a reference to an agreement to arbitrate under the 1996 legislation. That's easy enough. And so in some of these provisions, it's quite straightforward. You, you can see that uh, the Act intends, uh, for example, the Airports Authorities Act uh, is now read effectively that if there's a dispute uh, about uh, the valuation of uh, capital improvements at the end of the lease, then uh, the matter will be uh, referred to arbitration under the Arbitration Act 1996 and the subsection shall be deemed to be an arbitration agreement within the meaning of that Act. That's not what the Airport Authorities Act says, but that's the effect of it now that we've got the Arbitration Act 1996 in place. That's straightforward. Um, but there are a few, as I say, that are quite as simple as that. And I think probably the, the one that caught my attention most was the Part 4 of the Commerce uh, Act which I've talked about, um, and which, as I say, it says that if you can't reach a settlement in, in those cases involving little or no competition, you've got to go to arbitration. Uh, and then section 53J2, the Arbitration Act 1996 does not apply to arbitration under this section, although the Commission can refer to the Arbitration Act when it, the Commission, sets the terms under which the arbitration will take place. So I don't know, as, as I say, if you got appointed under one of those, uh, the first thing I would suggest is that you say yes, because it would be interesting, it would be big, it would be challenging. And the second thing you should do is say what are the terms that are going to apply and make sure you're, you're happy with that. Um, something of an aside, but I, I did notice when I was going through all these piles of statutory references, some rather odd ones, and one that Serene raised with me to consider, and which does seem to be odd, is uh, the uh, employment relations field, uh, where section 155 says, well, nothing in <coughs> the Employment Relations Act prevents anyone from going to arbitration um, if they want to. And then subsection 2 says, if the parties to an employment agreement purport to submit an employment relationship problem to arbitration, A, nothing in the Arbitration 90 Act 1996 applies. B, the parties must determine the procedure for the arbitration. Now, there'll be people in the room who know more about employment law and employment practice than I do, but just immediate, it's not immediately obvious to me why that was thought to make sense. Um, I'm not going to take you through uh, the, some of the problems that we, can, we have with that, that you can deal with uh, under the Crown Minerals Act, safe to say that if you do look at the Crown Minerals Act, you can see a pretty thorough set of provisions for what has to be decided, how the procedure has to run, and what the arbitrator has to do. To the extent that you could easily argue that the provisions of the Crown Minerals Act are an exclusive code, and that although it doesn't say this is not an arbitration of the Arbitration Act, that may be what it's intended to mean. And, uh, there's no easy answer to that um, because, um, but, well, th there isn't any easy answer. One of, the, one of the problems with it is that under the Crown Minerals Act, it turns out 
and this is another feature of some of the references, that what the legislature is actually asking you to do is not just be an arbitrator, but also a conciliator slash mediator as well. So under the Crown Minerals Act, an arbitrator has got to make a decision about rights of access to land for exploration purposes, but before doing so, has to use his or her best endeavours to secure a settlement of the matter. And that takes you into that whole complex area of MEDAR. Um, and if I can say it here, if you ever get into a MEDAR situation or you're asked to do that, <coughs> go straight to His Honour Justice Fisher's decision in <coughs> Farms against someone's name from I can't remember. <laughs> That's the one. Uh, because you'll find some golden rules for dealing with MEDAR. The principal one, if I can say it, being that you should never caucus with the parties. Um, but there's more wisdom in that than I would. It's a different topic. But anyway, the point is that you're not just being appointed as an arbitrator in the Crown Minerals Act. You have other roles to play, which the Arbitration Act has nothing to say about. Um, let me just uh, wrap it up by saying that it's my observation, having done this work, that uh, there's no slowdown in the legislative technique of referring matters to arbitration where that seems to be an appropriate way of getting a result. In fact, you could argue that uh, in the telecommunication, uh, sorry, in the Commerce Act area, uh, minority shareholders' disputes, right-of-way easements, uh, right-of-ways and easements, and um, uh, some of the others that I've, I've mentioned, uh, the legislature is actually pushing uh, matters into arbitration that uh, hitherto we wouldn't have expected to find there. So, um, from an arbitrator's perspective, what does that mean? Uh, I've suggested, first of all, be uh, very clear about the basis on which you've been appointed. Uh, be very clear about um, who will decide if your appointment is challenged. See, take the Crown Minerals Act. The way that works is that you know, Joe Exploration Company wants to come onto your land to, to do whatever they want to do on your land by way of looking for minerals. And you say, no, I want to have that. Uh, after a certain period of time, the Exploration Company writes to the Ministry of Economic Development and says, please appoint an arbitrator. Uh, and the, the chief executive appoints the arbitrator. Now, what happens if the <coughs> matter comes before you and the first thing one of the parties says is but I didn't get the notices that should have been served in accordance with the Act. I didn't get them in time. Who's going to decide that? It, do you have, it, you, there's no express reference to the Arbitration Act so it's not obvious on the face of it that you can refer to the provisions of the Arbitration Act and the schedules that allow an arbitrator to decide his or her own jurisdiction. But if you you can't decide whether or not you've got jurisdiction to do, do it. Where does that leave everyone? They're then going to have to go off to court, which must be the very thing that the legislation is designed to avoid. So there are some complex issues there. I'd say, um, and this has come up before, you know, what protection will you have if you do the work and someone says you did it wrong? Um, it's always struck me, and I, I'm sure I'm in good company with this, that the provision that in protects arbitrators in the Arbitration Act itself is woefully deficient because it doesn't go anywhere near the issues of uh, contractual liability or fiduciary liability. And one of the odd things about some of this legislation, the, 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 the Crown Minerals Act being one such legislation, is that the immunity provision in that legislation is much, much more extensive than the immunity provision in the Arbitration Act. The, the immunity provision of the Crown Minerals Act basically says that an arbitrator is immune from anything that they do in the process. But, uh, of course, other bits of legislation, and I'm going to say the Commerce Act uh, stuff again, certainly maybe the, uh, the Companies Act uh, provisions, you, you would have to say to yourself, well, what is my immunity? And remember, this is a situation where you're being appointed, not by agreement, so you don't have the same opportunity to negotiate an agreement with the parties. I'm not saying you can't negotiate an agreement with parties, of course you can. 
but um, that starts to then turn what was a statutory reference into an ad hoc arbitration. Um, and so if, if you're looking at this question of what happens if it all turns to custard and I've got nothing but the act in my appointment to rely on, where will I be? And I suggest the answer to that is not clear in many cases. Uh, and I could say the same about how and when will you be paid. You'd probably be interested in that. But um, I can say from experience that can come as a considerable surprise to someone who's dealing in a right-of-way dispute to find that they're going to have to pay. And again, you need to be very clear if that's happening, then to the extent that the Arbitration Act applies, what that means. Unless I'm wrong, I don't think the Arbitration Act obliges the parties to be jointly and separately liable for fees. So you've got to go down that whole track of, well, am I going to get some money in up front? If so, from who? What if only one party pays and the other doesn't? Um, there are complications uh, there. And the final conclusion of my paper is really just a, a sort of a wishful thinking, really. But if we could get the parliamentary draftsman in here and say, look, if you're going to do this in future, here's some of the things that we think you should do. Uh, on my list uh, would be to say, well, don't call someone an arbitrator unless you mean it. If you don't want them to have the provisions under the Arbitration Act, call them something else. Call them an independent decision maker or a whatever, but don't call them an arbitrator, just so that we don't get confused. Uh, I would also uh, suggest that, uh, and this is really no different from a commercial contract, it really is helpful when you're um, referring something that's going to happen in the future to arbitration, to have a clear protocol for what's to happen if the parties can't agree on an arbitrator. <coughs> and as I've said, it's really interesting to see that Ammons turns up uh, the president of Ammons turns up in, 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 well, a number of statutes and regulations. Uh, also the president of the Law Society, uh, very commonly referred to. And that's a good thing. I think you're going to do that. It's a good thing. Um, the easiest statutory references are, are the simplest. Um, my own view, and I hope there'll be some who disagree with me, but my own view is that it's a waste of time in this kind of in this kind of situation to have these complicated layered provisions about first you're going to go to mediation and then if that doesn't work you're going to do this just send the jolly problem to arbitration the parties will settle if they want to um, but these long complicated provisions about how you've got to do uh, the party's got to mediate as well I don't think it helpful be very clear if you're going to appoint someone as a conciliator as well as an arbitrator that that's what you intend to do and if you want to set someone up to make a decision uh, don't call them a mediator that'll do I, 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 as I say in my paper there are, I'm sure there are many issues and this is a bit of a sort of a flyover I'm sorry it's probably for arbitration train spotters more than anything else but um, my, my <coughs> overall conclusion would be that if you're in this situation Caveat arbitrator. Thank you. Do we have time for questions or complaints? I don't believe any complaints. Hello. Uh, uh, Robert Fisher Auckland. Royden, I'm uh, worried that if taxpayers find out about your paper, they're going to be very annoyed because from their taxes, they have paid for an elaborate system of public courts. And then if they have a dispute which uh, falls into perhaps a uh, right of way and refer to a whole lot of others, they have to then turn around and pay fees to a private arbitrator, uh, which of course is an excellent arrangement from one of your members of Ammons. And uh, I, I'm wondering, whether we can extract from you a, um, a solemn undertaking not to publish this any further and <laughs> to destroy the uh, I, I, I decline to give the undertaking. <laughs> um, and uh, w what I will say is that this question of statutory references came up in the 1991 Law Commission report. I see um, it's gone, but it, 
was referred to, and this very problem was discussed. Uh, and the view that seems to have prevailed was that of uh, Mr. Ian Mackay, then of Kensington Swan, um, who said, well, there is a debate here, but at the end of the day, surely it's a question about what is the right procedure for the particular kind of dispute. Um, I suspect that uh, the people who wrote that Law Commission report would be a little surprised to hear quite how the tendrils of arbitration are being pushed out into <coughs> things like uh, the Land Transfer Act uh, issues. Um, at a serious level, yes, it's a real, it, I think it's a real issue. I mean, what if they, what if, what if Parliament decided, look, we can beat this problem with the courts, we'll just make sure that every issue relating to a contract has to be arbitrated. Um, it's the same principle, it's just a much wider field of activity. I can see John Green cheering in the corner. <laughs> uh, yes, Bob. Yeah, I'm Bob Hawks from Auckland. Um, I'm happily retired now, except I'm still available for dispute resolution work. But I've come from the World Heart, and I've spoken for the Companies Act scenario and the right of way, plus also in cross leases, where you've got a fairly similar type of situation, although the cross leases is that that there is an agreement between the parties to go to arbitration. Yeah. Um, but we uh, there's been a compulsory appointment uh, or, or an imposed appointment. Um, I then go for my code of ethics mm. for a, and our, our, uh, our protocols for arbitration, mm. which tell us that we're to go off and get agreement on the terms of engagement. How the heck do you do that when you've got a resisting party? Um, one example, I had a party that um, refused to even give me an address for service. I've struck, I've struck that. People will say... Yeah. I've had a few where, yeah. where I've worked no, with no fees. Did you Any comments on that issue? Any further comments on that issue? If you're an arbitrator, if you hold the status of an arbitrator, you can go to the court. What direction? Yes, you can, but, but that costs the arbitrator money. Yeah, it does, but it resolves the jurisdictional issue. Just, just one... Yeah, I've I got to say, I'd be pretty pretty dark on being appointed as an arbitrator and then having to go off to the High Court to find out whether I've been appointed as an arbitrator. Uh, but but you, um, uh, you're right, I think. So well, the problem is you may be an arbitrator. So you have responsibility. In which so case you, you, you have don't to know. know what your role is. Yep. Just looking at the dates of the regulations and acts, there doesn't seem to be any increasing propensity for Parliament to make provision, this type of provision. Is that how you see it? Or? Or is there a, is there a trend? Tony, it's, look, I don't think the data that we have allows any firm conclusions, but actually I saw it, if anything, to the contrary. Because what I do think is that the land transfer example, the Commerce Act example, the example of um, the Companies Act, are areas where legislation, and that they're all, I think I'm right to say they're all since 2007, um, they are areas where, where this arbitration has been pushed out into fields where, where it, it certainly didn't apply before. So, thank you. Uh, well, that was a most interesting address, and I'd like to thank you for what you've done. I'm, I'd ask you to express your appreciation and you'd be welcome.